Good morning, Cross Community Church. I'm Craig Marquardt. I'm one of the elders here at Cross Community, and it's, I know there's a lot of people out there. I just can't see you for these lights. Oh, there they are. Um, we're here for, on Memorial Day weekend, and we, we want to remember uh, about Memorial Day that we, we observe, we honor uh, those who have fallen in service to our country, and we can't all uh, share the same sense of loss that a parent or a spouse or a child or a brother in arms has uh, in that loss, but we do uh, want to make sure we recognize that here this morning and, and this weekend, and that's why, uh, that's why we have a Memorial Day for those who have fallen. So we, we thank uh, those families that have lost loved ones in service. We thank you for that, uh, that sacrifice, and, and we remember that, and we thank you for it. As Claire said, we've rearranged the service some here this morning to accommodate communion. We want to take communion together. We'll be doing that here in a little bit. Um, we'll take a look, too, at uh, some aspects of self-examination that Paul asks us to consider as we take communion, and we'll finish uh, in song. Our text this morning comes from Luke chapter 22, and starting in verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, at this point in, in the text, um, in Luke 22, we're at the point where Jesus is finishing out his earthly ministry. Uh, we, we call that his earthly ministry, which began with his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist some three years prior to this point, and it's concluding here with these last few days in Jerusalem. Uh, and it's during this time that Jesus shares his final meal with his disciples, uh, his last supper. Uh, it's also at this point where he institutes the Lord's Supper. So he's celebrating Passover with his disciples. And at this point in history, the Jews had been celebrating Passover every year for about 1,500 years to this point where Jesus now has his last Passover meal with his disciples. Jesus committed um, a few ceremonies, certain rites, a couple of certain uh, ceremonies for his churches to observe and to follow those until he comes again. Uh, we call them ordinances, and some, some denominations call them sacraments, but sacraments kind of has a connotation of saving merit to it, and we know that communion, and we know that baptism, neither of those save, so, so we call them ordinances. And Jesus left two ordinances for his church, and only two, that's baptism and the Lord's Supper. And baptism, we're signifying the new believer's new life in Christ, in communion with Christ, and with the Lord's Supper, we are signifying our continuing life in communion with Christ. The, the uh, Lord's Supper has also been called communion, the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, the Mass. It's been called lots of things. Uh, scripture doesn't um, refer to them as those, but the biblical references to communion refer to it as the communion of the blood of Christ and the communion of the body of Christ, the breaking of bread, the Lord's table, and the Lord's Supper. And here in, in our circles, we commonly refer to it as the Lord's Supper communion, and I'll use those terms interchangeably here this morning. There are a, a few aspects of the Lord's Supper that have been a source of controversy over the years. Um, time of day that it's taken, what type of bread is used, uh, whether we fast before we take the elements or not. But uh, we're going to look to Scripture and see what, what Jesus did and what Je how Jesus led his disciples through um, through that Last Supper, through that Lord's Supper, and also some instruction that Paul gives us too. So uh, it's beginning. It's clear from the first three writers, the first three gospel writers, that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. 
Uh, the accounts recorded by those writers and by Paul. Paul received instructions about, um, about the, the Lord's Supper. And it's equally clear that Jesus asked us to follow this practice, to keep doing this practice until he returns. And the practice of the early churches, if we look in Acts, uh, we can see examples of them breaking bread, uh, participating at the Lord's table, and also uh, Corinthians, where Paul is addressing the Corinthians again about the Lord's Supper. So we see that even a few decades later, they're still taking the Lord's Supper. So it's, it's clear that it's something Jesus started, that it was a practice that was followed um, for a definite period of time. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, uh, Paul's writing and he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we have instructions to continue this practice until the Lord returns. We have a lot to look forward to between now, uh, or on his return, but between now and then, we're to take communion, we're to take this Lord's Supper as a remembrance of Jesus' death. So some of the other controversies that have followed with, uh, with communion, with the Lord's Supper, uh, center around the nature of the elements, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Um, some have thought that the bread and the wine become the actual body and blood of Christ when it's properly blessed. And we don't have that example in Scripture, but what we do see is a spiritual presence, a real spiritual um, uh, uh, tie to the elements and a presence of Jesus in those elements where he has told his followers to, that this is my body and this is my blood. Um, it's obviously not the actual body and blood, but we have that spiritual presence of Jesus in the elements. Jesus promised to be with his, uh, to be with us whenever believers are gathered together and when we worship. And so if he's present when we're gathered, he's present too when we're taking the elements of communion. And we, um, we receive those elements in his presence and we're blessed by his presence here with us when we take those elements. It's important to note that um, we take those elements in faith. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We have faith in his word. We have faith what he tells us, that he's come here. He's present with us when we're gathered. He's present, too, when we take those elements. So we believe that the, the meaning of the ordinance to take the Lord's Supper, to take communion, is primarily summed up in the command of Christ, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, so it's a symbolic act of obedience where members of the church gather and through taking the bread and taking the juice, we, memor we memorialize the death of Jesus and anticipate his second coming. That's what we're doing. The primary meaning of the Lord's Supper then is that it's a symbolic memorial. It's a remembrance of two things. One, it's a remembrance of the death of Jesus. Both of the elements point to his death, the bread, his body, and, and the juice, his blood. And it's also a reminder that Jesus not only died, but he was raised from the dead and he's coming again. And we are to look forward to that time as we take the elements. So who can partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper? It's, it's clear from Scripture that uh, only believers are entitled to take the elements. The very nature of the supper is the communion of the body and the communion of the blood of Christ indicates that the table is only for those who share in him. Um, Acts chapter 2 says, uh, we read there in Acts chapter 2 that those who shared in the breaking of bread, that's shared at the Lord's table, were those who gladly received his word and continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So we consider Jesus' own words. He said to do this in remembrance of him. How can you remember him in whom you've never believed in the first place? So we don't come to this table to get faith. We come to this table uh, because we have faith. We already have faith to come to this table. So those who don't have faith aren't invited to the table. Jesus' example tells us, too, that it would be rare that uh, somebody participating would not yet have been baptized. The, um, Jesus began his earthly ministry with his baptism. And then at the end of his ministry, we have the Lord's Supper here. So there may be some folks here that are very recently saved, have not yet had the opportunity to be baptized. You're welcome to join us. Um, 
people that aren't baptized, as long as you're a believer, if you've confessed with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you are saved, according to Romans chapter 10. So those are the folks that are invited. Everybody who's saved is invited to this table here this morning. Um, the normal pattern is for a new believer to be baptized soon on the heels of his or her profession of faith. So that's what we would expect. And so if you have questions about baptism, if you're a believer, still have questions about baptism, get hold of one of the elders, get hold of a group leader, get hold of somebody here to uh, help answer your questions about baptism. But baptism is not a requirement to participate in the Lord's Supper. We would expect you to be baptized because that's the normal pattern for a new believer, but it's not a requirement, so we don't want to uh, have any confusion there. Here at Cross Community, we practice open communion, so without hesitation, all who are believers may join us here in this meal this, this morning. Um, So within the walls of this building here this morning, what we're about to do is probably one of the most evangelistic things we'll do. If you consider, evangel if you consider a baptism and the Lord's Supper, those are exclusionary practices, right? Those are only for believers. Um, baptism is, is for those who confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead. So is the Lord's Supper. And when we participate in either of those, it's a statement saying, you, everybody, people need to be saved, need to turn to Christ and be saved. And we, we do that, when we do that here as a group, when we do it as believers only, there will be people here who are not saved. If you're here this morning and you haven't made that profession of faith in Jesus' shed blood for the sacrifice uh, for your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, we still want you to stay. Please stay with us if you haven't made that profession. Stay with us, but please don't take the elements with us. This really is an exclusionary event for those who, uh, or exclusionary ceremony for those of us who believe. We want you to witness our communion with our Lord and with each other when we take this. And we want you to, to see the very real uh, connection that we have with Jesus and we have with each other here. But we also take very seriously Paul's instruction for people to not take the elements in an unworthy manner. Uh, we want you to, um, we absolutely want what's best for you. We want you to be here. We want you to witness this. But we also want the Holy Spirit to, to work in you. We want him to open your hearts and open your minds so that you can see what we do here. And you can be a part of that too uh, if you are saved, as the gospel makes clear um, and witnessing our ceremony here this morning. So here in a few minutes, I'll ask the deacons to come forward with the elements, and uh, we will take the, the bread and the juice. So we have those little cups that have the foil lid on it. The juice is underneath that, that little foil lid, and then on top of that is a wafer, and on top of that is a thin plastic film. Um, after a moment of prayer, we'll, and, and as you're ready... You'll come forward, take the elements, and return to your seat. Uh, please don't eat the bread or drink the juice upon your return. We want to take it together. We'll take that together. Uh, but you might spend some time opening the package, getting it ready, because some of those things are a little, I don't know if you ever used those before, but they're kind of hard to get started, and my fingers don't work like they used to. So it takes a little bit of time to get that. Uh, you may want to peel up the, the wafer and, and get the juice started. That way you'll be ready when we all take it together. So either before you come forward or uh, after you've come forward and taken the elements back to your seat, we um, want you to spend some time in self-examination. And we're doing this in response to Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So if you recall the context here, of Paul writing to the Corinthians, um, you remember he's, he's addressing various issues that they had either questions about or things that they were doing wrong. 
I, I remember a short Bible study we did about each of the books of the Bible and the catchphrase to remember what was happening in, in Corinthians, especially the first letter of the Corinthians that Paul wrote, was uh, the catchphrase was spanking the saints. Paul spends time rebuking the Corinthians about different things that they had going on in their, uh, in their church there. In this passage, Paul's rebuking the Corinthians for their selfishness when they come together uh, for communion. He isn't correcting them about the elements. He's not correcting them about the ordinance. Uh, but rather he's correcting them about their inconsiderate conduct toward each other when they're at the Lord's table. And his remedy for this is for a person to examine themselves and be in a right relationship ready to take communion. And he told them to do that by examining themselves first. So how do we examine ourselves? Well, I think first, first we look up to God. Look to God. And we want to ask the question, are you right with God? Are you right with God positionally? Have you confessed with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? If you have, you are saved and you are in a right position with God. You are right with God positionally. Jesus' shed blood on the cross paid for our sins and it's our professed faith in his atoning sacrifice that allows us to participate in communion. So are you right with God? Look up and then look within. Are you right with God practically? Are you right with God practically? Are you sold out to everything that glorifies God? Nothing compares with the intimacy that we can share with God. And, and what we want to do is make sure we don't have hindrances in that intimacy that we can share with him. So your personal time of reflection may be a mix of gratitude and thankfulness. It may have uh, elements of asking for forgiveness and asking for guidance on how to put those hindrances behind us, those things that um, hinder our intimacy with God. And then finally, we'd look up, look within, and we'd look around. Look around at our relationships with others. In Paul's instruction, he defines what an unworthy manner is, and he says that it's those not discerning the body. So we're to take thought of all of our relationships within the body of Christ. We're to look at, make sure our actions indicate that just as there's one bread and there's one body, um, that we are united with each other when we take this. So we're, the Holy Spirit is a, a bond that bonds us to, to Christ, that bonds us to each other. And it's during this time we want to make sure that all our relationships within the body are uh, reflecting the, the character of the Lord who we represent when we come to this table. So if we could have the uh, deacons come forward with the elements, and what we're going to do is Take a moment. Uh, you can do this either before you come get the elements or you can come get them and take it back to your seat. But we want to take this together. There will be a, a couple of places up front. There will be one in back that you can go to. Um, we want to spend some time in personal reflection and uh, in self-examination for those things. Look up, look within, look around. And then we will take the elements together. So... Um, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have here this morning to come and to unite with your son Jesus through the elements and to unite with each other as your body calls or as your word calls us to be one body. Father, we pray that as we um, consider these elements, uh, Lord, that we consider our relationship with you and our relationships with each other. Father, prepare our hearts to take these elements and prepare our hearts in worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.